Good morning. Welcome to the 2019 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Ticketmaster. My name is Gerardo Guadiana. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and it is my pleasure to be introducing our panel this morning titled The Elam Ending Examining the Original Version's Ability to Meet Its Aims and Exploring Minor Modifications to Build on Its Early Promise. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Nick Elam, Assistant Professor of Educational Leadership at Ball State University. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank Daryl Morey and Jessica Gelman, all the organizers of the conference, for the opportunity to speak. Also, Z Siddiqui, who is one of the student organizers, for all of his help along the way. It's really been a thrill for me uh, to see what started as really just an independent project years ago come to life. Uh, this Elam ending concept come, go from paper to the court. And so it's a pleasure to be here to present. Uh, an overview of the, of the pr presentation, I'll start with an overview of the Elam ending format if you're not familiar with the format, and then we'll talk about how the format worked at the basketball tournament in 2018 for its full 71 game event and how the format is doing a good job of meeting its primary and secondary aims. And I've been very pleased with the positive feedback that the format has received so far. I look at the format with a very critical eye. I think scrutiny is how the idea gets better. And so we'll take a look at some of the common criticisms of the format and why I think they are either uh, unfounded or overstated or could easily be addressed with a minor modification. We'll talk about some of the recommendations that I think can make the format even better. And we'll have a little bit of time for questions and comments at the end. So the Elam ending format, it's not meant to change the game of basketball, really it's to do the opposite, to preserve a more natural style of play through the end of every game and give us more real basketball during crunch time. I really do feel like it's a way that we can keep and enhance all the things that we enjoy about late game play and eliminate and alleviate all the things that we don't enjoy. And the idea in a nutshell is that you would just play most of the game with a clock and play the last part of the game without a clock. The way that it works so far, uh, for TBT, before they adopted the Elam ending, they would play a 36-minute fully timed game. And then once they adopted the Elam ending, they would cut out the last four minutes of the game. They play 32 minutes with a clock. And then uh, once you reach that time threshold, then you set a target score equal to the leading team's score plus seven. So for example, if the score is 65 to 60 at that time threshold, then you would play to 72. You get rid of the clock, first team to 72 wins the game. And the idea is that if you have the lead, there's no reason to stall and play passively. You have to keep playing assertively to get to that target score. If you are trailing, there's no need anymore to foul and hand away free points when you're on defense. Uh, there's no reason to rush and force up ugly shots when you're on offense. That whole combination of factors makes the outcome of games less predictable, makes late comebacks more likely. And every game would end with the swish of a net, so you'd have more memorable game-ending moments. So here in this section, we'll talk about how the Elam ending worked in TBT 2018. And we'll talk about what I see as the five primary aims of the format. And then we'll talk very briefly about uh, some secondary aims of the format. But the most fundamental aim is to eliminate and reduce the deliberate fouling strategy that we see so often by trailing defenses. We see how commonly uh, we see that format, or I'm sorry, we see that strategy under the regular format in the NBA and NCAA. And in most of the games where we don't see deliberate fouling, it's because the trailing team has just given up. They don't even bother with fouling, and that's not such a good thing either. Uh, but as you can see, the Elam ending gives trailing teams a better option of playing legitimate defense, and so it's virtually eliminated uh, deliberate fouling in those games in TBT. Another fundamental aim is to eliminate or reduce stalling by the leading offense. Under the regular format, there's definitely an incentive for leading teams to stall and play passively uh, during the final stretch of the game. So for this, I look at fourth quarters and second halves and overtimes uh, for NBA and NCAA, or for NBA, I look at the last three minutes, NCAA, I look at the last four minutes. For TBT, I look at the last two minutes of timed play and then all of the untimed portion of the game but you can see how rare it is under the regular format to get a stretch like that where there's no stalling at all. And in TBT, it's much more common, which is a good thing, uh, to get a stretch where there's no stalling in the game. And uh, I actually think that as time goes on, we're gonna see even less stalling in TBT games and those Elam ending games 
Uh, right now we're seeing sometimes we're a leading team for a possession or two as the time portion of the game winds down. They'll, they'll slow it down a little bit, but there's a risk in doing that with the Elam Indy because you know you're going to have to ramp your offense back up again once the untimed portion of the game starts. And I think as it stands, trailing defenses are making it a little bit too easy for the leading offense to stall like that. I think as time goes on, we're going to see them really ramp up the pressure uh, because at that stretch of the quarter, they still have fouls to give in most cases. So I think that's actually going to make for a pretty exciting stretch of the game. So I see this improving even more uh, naturally. Another aim is to eliminate and reduce rush and sloppy possessions by the trailing offense. I think it's really striking and in many ways unsatisfying to see the most uh, important possession of a game under the regular format really turn into a blooper reel. We're seeing uh, some ugly shots that we would never see at any other time of the game during the most important possession. We're used to seeing teams score over one point per possession in the NBA and NCAA, and we see that proficiency plummet in buzzer beater situations. There's no true apples to apples to comparison for the Elam ending because there's no clock at the end of the game. But if we look at the most pressure packed situations under the Elam ending, what I call virtual sudden death situations, this is where both teams are within three points of the target score. We're seeing teams able to maintain a higher quality of play. I also believe the Elam ending can provide greater hope for late comebacks. Uh, we know that under the regular format when a team has to resort to that deliberate fouling strategy that hardly ever works. Um, and even this figure is a little too generous because it excludes all those blowout games where a team doesn't even bother with fouling. Uh, but with the Elam ending, you're taking away two major forces that work against trailing teams. You no longer have to, to foul and hand away free points when you're on defense. You no longer have to rush and force up ugly shots when, when you're on offense. Again, there's not a true apples-to-apples apples comparison because uh, there's no stretch of the game where a team would normally resort to fouling. But we can look anecdotally at this small sample of games and see uh, some pretty amazing comebacks uh, when a team really had its back up against the wall. Even some games where a team was not able to come back and win the game, there were some games where a team was able to come back and tie the game or take the lead or really make things interesting, really closing the gap and gaining ground. And again, that's rare under the regular format to a team to be, for a team to be able to gain ground at the end of the game. So I don't think the Elam winning would necessarily lead to this avalanche of additional comebacks, but I do think it would provide a healthy uptick in late comebacks and make the games uh, less predictable. I think the Elam ending would provide more memorable game ending moments. Uh, we see under the Regular format, just how rare it is for a game to end with a meaningful made basket. Even in some of those cases where it happens, the clock still gets in its own way because what should just be this really uninhibited celebration is dampened because it necessitates a replay review. We have to go to the monitor to see if the shot was released on time. Uh, but, and we see how many games really just end with a whimper. In TBT, we're seeing a cool variety of endings to these games. Um, and I really just think that we would become addicted to the images and the sounds and the traditions and the trivia that go along with walk-off shots. I think it opens up a world of marketing and presentation possibilities that would benefit leagues and players and broadcast partners. I think it opens up a world of uh, prop bet opportunities that fans would enjoy too. So those are the primary aims of the format. Here is a quick list of some of the secondary aims and the formats being effective in this regard also. I'll highlight just a couple here. One that I think is kind of an under-discussed uh, aspect of the format is that the Elam ending guarantees that there will not be any game clock related controversies or reviews uh, at the end of the game. One thing that I think might be over discussed is the effect on the time elapsed during that final stretch. The idea or the, the aim of the Elam ending is not really to speed up games. It's just to give us better quality basketball. But what we're seeing is kind of this cool dual effect where uh, the games like blowout games are ending more quickly, which is I think is what you would want. And games uh, were, that last a little bit longer, the drama is necessarily building. The leading team is not getting to the finish line, and the trailing team is gaining on them. And that's very different from the regular format, where some of the most drawn out endings, um, the drama is not building, and the game is not um, getting closer. So again, I've been very pleased with the amount of positive feedback up to this point in the most basic version of this 
format. I think maybe one of my favorite uh, forms of feedback was an article in the comeback that called the Elam ending the best thing to happen to basketball this century. That was certainly a nice endorsement. But again, I keep my ear to the ground about criticisms of the format. I think that type of scrutiny makes the idea better. Uh, but some of the most common criticisms I hear, I think, are either unfounded or overstated or could easily be addressed. So that's what we'll talk about here. One concern I hear is that the Elam ending wouldn't curtail deliberate fouling, that it would just compel a team if they're down to foul as the time portion of the game winds down. I'm really not worried about this at all. Uh, we're not seeing this happen. And uh, we know that the deliberate fouling strategy is not an effective way to overcome a deficit. But as you can see here, it's not even an effective way to narrow a deficit at all. Now, under the regular format, it's still a trailing team's best and only option, but the Elam ending gives them a better option of playing legitimate defense, so I don't think we would see this. But if for some reason this became a common strategy, I think there's a way that we can uh, easily address that. I'll talk about that later in the presentation. Another concern is that the Elam ending uh, includes a scenario where it might be advisable to foul deliberately. I call this the 3-2-1 scenario where the offense is exactly three points away from the target score. The defense is exactly one or two points away from the target score. And the question is, well, do you foul to prevent a game-winning three-pointer? Um, account me as someone who would rather see that type of scenario play out more fluidly. I think it'd be more fun and more exciting. Even if this went unaddressed, I still think it's an improvement over the widespread deliberate fouling that we see under the regular format. Um, this would happen in far fewer games. When it does happen, it's not repeatable. You wouldn't see foul after foul. And when it happens, it would always proceed an exciting finish. But I do think that there's a way to curtail the fouling that we see here. And so I'll discuss that uh, in the recommendations portion. I hear sometimes that the Elam ending eliminates the drama of buzzer beaters. And I enjoy buzzer beaters just as much as anybody else. And so that's why it's really been important for me not only to crunch the numbers about the Elam ending, but to go into the arenas where TBT games are being played and get a feel for the arena. And I'm telling you that when these games come down to a sudden death situation or even many games that are decided by four points or more, they still have that look, that sound, that feel of a buzzer beater. And that's why I say that the Elam ending is a way that we can keep and enhance all the things that we already enjoy about late game play. Now, sometimes the way that this argument is laid out is to just cite great buzzer beaters throughout the history of basketball and just rest the case. Uh, but I think that's an incomplete argument. I think, uh, for one, it discounts how the Elam ending could have also provided a great finish to the same game. And then another big thing is I think it overlooks how so many really big games and good games throughout the history of basketball have just faded completely from memory without one signature moment to carry on uh, because they didn't end with a buzzer beater. And the Elam ending would have provided that one signature moment. I hear some say that the Elam ending is unsatisfying because a game can end with a free throw. Now, I find this to be the most ironic criticism of all. Uh, there are some games that can end under, with a free throw under the Elam ending, but if you don't like that, then what does that say about the regular format? That's the norm under the regular format for games to be decided by free throws, where we haven't declared a winner yet, but if the leading team can make some free throws, we'll go ahead and call them the winner. That's the norm under the regular format, and that's the exception under the Elam ending. I hear some say that they would miss overtime with the Elam ending. I'm not worried about this either. I, I just don't think that overtime delivers as often as we think. Uh, if we look at the possible ways that a second half or overtime or fourth quarter, any of those periods could end and rank it in terms of excitement, uh, most exciting being a made basket to win, then a made basket to tie, then some sort of an unsuccessful meaningful possession, and then some sort of a meaningless possession. Uh, you can see from these figures here, it's hard for an overtime to live up to the period that came before it. Uh, so it kind of sets up an anticlimactic finish. And just to think about it more theoretically, if you think about um, under the regular format, as a close game winds down, you know that there's three possibilities, that my team's going to win, my team's going to lose, or we're going to head to overtime. Under the Elam ending, as a close game winds down, there's only two possibilities, my team's going to win or my team's going to lose. You get rid of that third neutral option, and I think it raises the stakes, raises the excitement. So it's been a blast to see uh, this format play out at a high level, and that's a credit to the players, the organizers of TBT, the officials, um, everybody involved 
with that, the coaches. And now the fun really starts, I think, in looking at how to make this concept even better. So one thing I would do just for TBT is to increase the number that's used to determine the target score. Up to this point, uh, TBT has cut out the last four minutes of the game and then used a plus seven. And so we track how much theoretical game time is elapsing during that untimed stretch of the game. If we're cutting out four minutes, we're hoping that it works out to be about four minutes. Games are ending a little bit quicker than that, and so TBT has the opportunity to beef up that untimed portion of the game, use a plus eight or a plus nine instead. In some cases, the time portion of a game ends with a, a shooting foul. And if it's the leading team that's going to the line, then they really have a chance to cut closer to the target score before live ball play ever resumes. And so I think going forward, in those cases where the time portion of the game ends with a shooting foul, go ahead and administer those free throws first before setting the target score. We've seen how the Elam ending has virtually eliminated uh, deliberate fouling as it is. But I think there are ways to further curtail that. Uh, some say, again, that trailing teams should foul as the time portion of the game winds down or even during the untimed portion of the game. We're really not seeing that a whole lot. But just as a way to prevent that from ever happening, to take away any inclination to foul there, I think you could give the fouled team the option of shooting free throws or taking the ball out of bounds. If it's a good free throw shooter who happens to be fouled, go ahead and go to the line. If it's a poor free throw shooter who gets fouled, then you might want to take the ball out of bounds and resume your possession. Uh, what's beautiful about this is what we hear this proposed sometimes as a fix-all for the deliberate fouling that we see under the regular format. Just give the team the option to shoot free throws. But you could never do this under the regular format. It would be taking the trailing team's only option, which is deliberate fouling, and making it even less appealing than it already is without giving them a better alternative. So you could never ever do this under the regular format, but you could easily add a provision like this under the Elam ending. Another case where we talked about how the, uh, the team might be compelled to foul some of those late game sudden death situations to foul uh, to prevent a game winning three pointer. And I've actually given presentations about ways to curtail this. And some of the ways that I uh, presented were viable, but I think maybe over engineered. So I think the idea is that you just essentially outlaw fouls on the floor in those cases. Now, as you read through this rule for the first time, it sounds pretty complex, but I think this is a rule that really wouldn't have to be enforced, which might be the definition of a good rule. I think teams would look at this and say, hey, we just can't foul in this situation anymore like maybe we used to. We're just going to have to play really good defense, um, really guard against the three. And I think you would see those sudden death situations play out more fluidly in a more fun and exciting way. The next recommendation is that during the untimed portion of the game, after any made field goal, you take the ball out of the basket, you check the ball to the official really quick before you inbound the ball, just a quick split second there. This all has to do with a discussion or an aspect that I think is pretty fascinating that I've looked at since about 2012, and it's this question of if you have a lead late in a game in the Elam ending, is it smart to neglect your defensive responsibilities by either cherry picking or leaking out? Cherry picking being uh, you just play four on five and you're perfectly willing to give up a made basket to try to turn it into your own run out. Uh, leaking out would be you start out playing five on five half court defense, but before you've really seen the possession all the way through, you send somebody back uh, to the other end. So one question is whether that's smart. The next question is, uh, if it is smart to do that, is that such a bad thing? Personally, I'm not a fan of it, and I would like to address it, but I've talked to some who have a vested interest in the sport of basketball, have a vested interest in TBT, who actually think it's exciting. And uh, if you look at maybe the highlight of the NBA season, which was on January 10th, a long pass from Nikolai Jokic to Jamal Murray, uh, that was an example of a leak out. If I were charting that game the same way that I chart games for TBT, I would have counted that as a leak out by Jamal Murray there. And it provided one of the most exciting moments of the season. So again, it's the question of, uh, is it even a bad thing? But if some sort of regulation is needed, then the question is, well, how do you do it? Um, I think there's dozens of different options. This is uh, one place to start. I could probably give a presentation just about all the different ways to address that. I don't know if it would be a very exciting presentation, but uh, I think this is a good place to start. But one thing to look at is how effective, how common were those strategies during TBT 2018. So in all the games and all the possessions, there were 16 times where a team cherry-picked. 
Four times they allowed a made basket, which is something they were perfectly willing to do. Of those 16 times, there were six times where they got the run out that they were looking for. That's what they were hoping for. But what's really interesting, and I think this is very, very important, there was not a single time where a team cherry-picked, allowed a made basket, and then were able to convert it into a run out on, on their end. Essentially, in all those six uh, runouts, they had to earn it still somehow by forcing a live ball turnover, by forcing a missed shot and gathering a defensive rebound. They were never able to cash in on allowing a made basket. If we look at leak outs, you see a pattern here where in almost every case it was somebody closing out on an outside jump shooter and kind of using that as a head start toward the other end. That's what Jamal Murray did on the play that I alluded to earlier. Um, I think there's kind of a beautiful self-governing quality here where uh, if you're trailing in an eliminated game and you think you're just going to resort to chucking threes, you leave yourself very vulnerable to leak outs. Thirteen times a team allowed a made basket when they leaked out, and of all those 31 cases, there were only seven times where they actually got the run out that they were looking for. It was surprising how ineffective it was. But again, most importantly, I think, is that there was not a single case where a team leaked out, allowed a made basket, and then were able to convert it into a run out on the other end. In those seven instances where they got that run out, uh, somehow, some way, they still had to earn the run out by forcing a live ball turnover, forcing a missed shot, and gathering a defensive rebound, whatever it might be. So that's the spirit of this modification that I am uh, proposing here, that we're not going to eliminate runouts altogether, but by requiring a team to check the ball to the official just that quick split second, uh, again, it reduces the likelihood that a team could ever cash in on allowing a made basket. It makes, uh, gives them more uh, reason than there already is to really honor their defensive responsibilities. So maybe that's not enough regulation, maybe it's too much, who knows, but whatever way that is needed to address this, there are so many different options um, that I'm really not worried about this. Um, I think there's, there's some way out there to address this if that's even necessary. So the main takeaways, the ELAM ending format and just this basic version is really working very well and meeting its primary and secondary aims. Been very pleased with that. And there was never really a thought that the original version was going to be the final version. This whole concept is meant to evolve and that evolution is just underway. And I think maybe the main thing is that whether you already favor the ELAM ending concept or if you are skeptical about it, all of those lingering concerns can easily be addressed with a minor modification. So we have some time for questions and comments. While I take those, I'll leave up uh, some of the great feedback that we received during TBT 2018. Yes? You mentioned gambling earlier. In-game live wagering on, say, the totals, how does kind of capping what the highest possible score could be impact that in-game wagering? I mean, obviously markets are going to take time to adjust to that, but you know, that does present kind of a concern there where we know there could be no more points than, than this. So, sure. So you talked about how capping the score, how that might have an effect on gambling. So, uh, you know, sports books have always found some way to stay one step ahead of the general public. I think this would just offer one more way to stay one step ahead. So I can't speak for them, but, you know, all those things would be a consideration for sure. But I think people, one thing that people would just fall in love with is this concept of, hey, I'm going to try to predict the, uh, who's going to make the winning shot and what type of shot it's going to be. I think those kinds of prop bets, would, people would just be crazy for those. Yes. Oh, great question. So, yeah, because there's two main settings to the ELAM ending. When do you shut off the clock, and then what do you play to? So you, you asked, well, why would I adjust the score rather than adjusting the time? I think that when you're laying out the ELAM ending, I think the first thing you look for is to set the time where you, where you want to stop the game. Um, I think, you know, the reason that I propose the things that I have for the NBA and NCAA is because those are when media timeouts already happen. That's around the time when you would start to see a team stall and play passively. Uh, you really don't see the fouling until about the last minute or so of a game, but you can't wait too long to shut off the clock or you're still going to see some of those uh, strategies that we see. So I think, I think you 
find, set the time first and then adjust the score as necessary. Um, and for TBT, you know, they've been doing plus seven, but I think plus eight or plus nine is probably uh, a better way to go. Yes. Great question. This will have to be the last question, but uh, the question had to do with you know, substitution patterns. Uh, would you, with the Elam ending, now that um, it's a little bit harder to to seal a win, are you going to leave your best players in the game longer, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, from a fan standpoint, I think it's great to see uh, the best players in the game at the end of the game. Uh, now you think about wear and tear, player safety, things like that. Uh, I think it is very likely that we would see the best players at the end of the game more, but keep in mind that we're also getting rid of overtime and the extra wear and tear that goes along with that. Uh, I think really just overall it would lead to just different substitution patterns throughout the game. You might rest uh, some, of your player, some of your best players, give them a, a few extra minutes off throughout the course of the game. So I think I don't think it um, eliminates strategy. I think it just gives a whole, a whole new opportunity for new strategies on substitution patterns. So that'll have to be our last question. I really appreciate um, everyone's interest and their attention. If there's something that we couldn't get to, you can reach out to me at this address here. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and cheers to the great game of basketball. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>